but we're going to be tracking this for the rest of the year. And if we see the numbers um, justify it, these point truly have said, if the numbers show that we need another person, we'll get another person. Um, at least that's what we're going to work with to try to get. We are only one of the few departments in the state that has a covert partner program such as this. Greenville has one, Greenville, Pitt County. I want to say Greensboro was another pilot site earlier last year, but we are one of a few. We bring it out online. It's already online. Um, so hopefully, if we see the success with it, this may be a model for other departments to try to implement their agencies. Okay? And I'll turn it over to Captain Thank you. Thanks, guys. Before we get into numbers, also what the Chief was saying, you know, the importance of the program and a lot of the work that Sergeant Edmonds has put into this to get the success we've had thus far. One of the other things we've done early on was we actually had the group come together uh, and had those stakeholders come in and we did some early evaluation. So if there were some tweaks and stuff to make early on, we've done a lesson learned with command staff. And as far as the data goes, like I said, Sergeant Edmonds will get into that. But then in addition to meeting the people on the front end, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't say on the back end now, we're also at it in a big advocate back into the police department. So some of these services that people need as victims and stuff after a case takes place, you know, we see them on the front when this kind of crisis side on a co-responder, but then when we have that incident and you got a victim that brings trauma and stuff of its own, the department will also be where in the process of hiring a victim's advocate. So though it's not part of that co-responder program, it's still going to touch some of those same issues and provide some of those resources to the community that they greatly need in these times of crisis. Um, I've also noticed the last couple of years, you know, Sergeant Edmonds and myself and a couple others were part of our crisis negotiator team. Um, and, you know, knock on wood, we're not called out there every day for these very high stress situations where you got to talk to somebody, you know, kind of off that ledge. Uh, but in the last couple of years, we have noticed that, you know, the need for that, you know, is going up. And not only here, but around it as we go to meetings and other communities. Um, these people suffering in these times of crisis with needing some, someone to talk to sometimes. Um, not only in Rocky Mountain, but across the state, we're seeing those types of things go up. So we do have the resources in place uh, to deal with that on our side, and our team does a really good job when they're called upon. Um, they've had a few incidents over the last year and a half. Um, one was a gentleman from George Street Bridge that we were able to successfully negotiate. Uh, we've had barricaded subjects in the house. Um, so in addition to sending that civilian out there, we also have an embedded team of crisis negotiators at the department that we utilize in these situations also. So to get into some of the numbers that, of the crisis mobile response, I'm going to let Sergeant Edmonds get dive in those as he's done a great job keeping up with all of us. Thank you, Kat. First of all, good afternoon, community. I'm Sergeant Jared Evans with the Rocky Mountain Police Department. I am your administrative sergeant for the city of Rocky Mountain Police Department. And what that entails basically is uh, training, um, recruiting, and um, whatever else Chief tells me to be. He is someone like a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. So, um, first of all, please allow me to apologize for my appearance. I, I was not prepared for this today, but when the talk tells you to do something, you get prepared quick. So, um, please, uh, if I trip up on my words a little bit, it's charging to my mind, not my heart. So, again, like I told you before, the uh, last time we met in March of 2022, uh, Chief Hassel tasked us with trying to come up with a way that we could better serve different members of our community who go through different crises related to overdose, mental health illnesses, um, and suicide, substance abuse issues, and things like that. Um, it was an inherent need that we needed to, as a, as a law enforcement agency, be very professional in how we respond to these incidents as they were on the incline, um, not just in our community, but in communities all over the country, all over the world, unfortunately. But as your police professionals, we still had a duty to respond and make sure we respond accordingly, professionally, and aligns with our core values to make sure we can give them the best police service that we could. So in doing so, we met with several stakeholders throughout the community, um, East Point, UNC 
to see NASH, uh, Trillium Healthcare Services, Integrated Family Services. And again, we enacted a plan. We came up with a plan, we met, we validated the, the need for the plan and how to implement that plan. That plan, as stated um, last time, was enacted on March 1st, and I'm here to give you a little bit of the results of that, if you don't mind. Um, Chief was correct earlier when he said there was over 1,500 cases that RHC responded to last year. To be exact, there was 1,776. Um, I will tell you that we found a flaw that has been corrected with our data, or how we collected data. Um, traditionally, law enforcement wasn't in the business of collecting data on mental health. It, it wasn't inherently necessary at that time. It has become inherently necessary now, okay, because again, uh, your police professionals are on the front lines and we are trained for emergency situations, but your police professionals are not clinicians. They're not doctors. They're not mental health providers. A lot of times police professionals are being called because there's nobody else to call. Um, and we're okay with that. We, we're built for that. So we got to prepare our men and women for how to deal with that. And what we learn is that sometimes the police has got to have somebody to call too. So <laughs> um, we was able to enact a plan with Integrated Family Services where they provided us with an in-house co-responder. That is a trained clinician that is housed within the Rock Mountain Police Department, embedded within our agency. Her office is right across from mine. I can see her. I say good afternoon and good morning to her every single time that I see her. And, yes, ma'am. We can hear about her, but what's her name? Her name is Narda Cherry. Okay. Uh huh. We call her KC. Okay. I'll spell her name for you. It's K N A R D A. Last name Cherry. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry about that. So, um, basically, when Ms. Cherry comes in, we've identified the peak hours Monday through Friday between 11 a.m. and roughly around about 7.30 and 8 p.m of when um, our officers are responding to the these calls primarily, for the most part. So with that being said, I told you about the total number of calls last year. I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a comparison analysis for the information I'm gonna give you as to how we progress. So if you will, let me go back a little bit. Yeah. From in a four month period, can I raise this right here, I'm sorry. That's off of my hands, I got to, I'm sorry. In a four month period between October 2022 and February 2023, our officers responded to approximately 679 mental health calls for service, overdose calls for service, and suicide related calls for service. Um, at that time, we did not have, of course, an integrated clinician within our facility. So we would rely on off site mobile crisis clinicians that would be called by doctor's offices or EMS professionals, the same folks that they were calling. And that was quite cumbersome upon our manpower. Reason being, because um, out of those 679, we got a response to about 74 during that time, during that time frame, that same four month time frame. Reason being that that manpower that was allocated for that particular mobile crisis entity was very limited. Uh, they were responding not only for citizens over here in Rocky Mountain, but out in Nash County, Edgecombe County, Halifax County, Wilson County, those same areas. Um, and they had to allocate their manpower as well. Is this before March 1st? Yes, okay. yes. So, um, with that being said, of the people that we, <laughs> of, the, of the citizenry that we come into contact with, um, our primary response was we would transport them to the hospital. Because if there wasn't a criminal need that needed to be assessed or a civil um, uh, suggestion, hey, this is a civil matter, you should try speaking to this person about it. If it wasn't criminal in nature, something a law enforcement professional could handle, the only person we knew to take you to to help them out would be the hospital in Harrison. So you can imagine the load that that put on the emergency room when 679 calls for service and the majority of them are being transported to the hospital, either because they're requesting to, because there's nobody else that can offer them help at that time. So with that being said, during that same time frame, the hospital reported that over 60% of the people that we were transporting to the hospital for assistance were being released within the first 24 hours of being there. 
So with that being said, if you do the math, 60% of the people going, they get released in the first 24 hours, what's wrong there? There's a disconnect. Either the services were not warranted, or maybe not enough sufficient services were being provided, and we was having a lot of repetitive calls for services. I can only speculate. I don't have the data to be able to tell you exactly what the downfall was. But what I can tell you is this, it required an enormous amount of police manpower to respond to the mental health calls for service, to transport them to the hospital, and to sit with them while they were getting mental health services that they needed. An enormous amount of manpower, manpower that could be out enforcing the law, doing neighborhood uh, projects, um, just sitting in the middle of the street, being a presence. Okay, so. That's kind of, just kind of a basis for you for four months prior to. All right, March 1st till uh, April 30th, there's been 217 calls for service total. All right, again, so we went from a four month period of 679 to a two month period of 217. We're projected right now to be under 50% of the calls for service over the four month period prior to the enacting this service. We believe we have identified what a contributing factor to that is, and that is follow-ups. One thing that I learned when I came on to the police department, when I, I had a bunch of mentors, I ain't gonna name all of them because I know you already know who they are, but it's one thing that they, that they always instilled in us as young law enforcement officers, and that's the need to follow up. If you have a victim of a crime, don't just talk to them when they're a victim of a crime, ride by the house the week after and say, hey, is everything okay? Is there anything else I can do for you? Did you get everything that you needed? Do you know what your police report number is? And that just helps you provide a different type of public service, okay? So we truly do believe that that same principle of follow-up is what's helping our numbers stay low because that's what Ms. Cherry does. Ms. Cherry not only responds to calls for service when she's needed, but in her downtime, she's following up with the people that she has come into contact with that were in crises beforehand. All right, so now, keep on moving. Of those uh, 217 calls for service, now we have two entities to help us out. Because Ms. Cherry can't work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We were able to revisualize and, and, and rebuild our mobile crisis response now that we developed this relationship with Intimate Family Services. Now we have another team of off-peak hours uh, clinicians that respond to our officers out in the field whenever Miss Cherry is not at work, okay? Which gives us more manpower now. And that data is also being tracked. So, of the 217 calls for service are bag up, okay? Those guys responded to 38 calls for service. Miss Cherry responded to 76 calls for service. That's just doing her normal work at hours. Get within here within the city of Rocky Mountain. All right? Now, I want to kind of break this thing down into two different tiers for you. Of the bag up and Miss Cherry, our on site person. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed something. You said there were 76 calls <laughs> that Miss Cherry responded to. That's correct. And 38 that backup officers responded to? No, the bag up clinicians. The bag up the yes. clinicians. So whenever the officers would respond to the scene uh -huh. and they assessed the scene and said that, hey, we need a clinician here. But Ms. Cherry was not on duty, we would call for those bagged up assessors to come out. So the 76, is that her going out with the officers? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. During that two month period. That's correct. Right. Yes, sir. And once your other people get there, your other service providers get there, is that officer freed up then? Not necessarily. Okay. Because um, our officers don't necessarily free up it, even when Ms. Cherry gets there. We want to make sure that she's safe, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, we want to make sure that she's safe. And when she looks at us and says, hey, guys, I'm good to go, and I, she has developed an amazing relationship with our officers. Our officers watch her back. When we see her out on the call sometimes, she's got her radio. She checks off on the scene that she may not be dispatched to when she's doing her follow-up. She has drive by and say, hey, Casey, you all right? And she'll give them a thumbs up just like you would see a police officer do when he's on the traffic stop on the side of the road. You've all seen them drive up. Yeah, thumbs it's, up at it's, it's scary as hell, all right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that, but that's the purpose behind it. Just to check on you. Okay. All right? So. <laughs> you say so. <laughs> so, that typically. Um, so, with that being said, of those uh, 
calls again, 76 of them were the ones that Ms. Cherry responded to. All right, so let's talk about hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. The bag of the bag of unit that we require, that we use all hours when Ms. Cherry is not at work, of the 38 calls for service that they responded to, there's been 23 hospitalizations that have been required out of those calls for service. But the good thing about that is that that's not the police officer saying you need to go to the hospital. And that's also not the community member saying, hey, sir, take it to the officer, take it to the hospital because I ain't got nowhere else to go and you ain't got nowhere else to take it. That is still a clinician saying, hey, you need some services that I can't give you, so let's go to the hospital. I'm going to sit with you and we're going to figure this out together. The good thing about that is when they get to the hospital, the officer now does what? Goes back and hits the road. Yeah. Goes back to work. That's the good thing. Now hang on to your socks. All right. 217 calls for service. Uh, Ms. Cherry responded to 76. Of the 76 calls for service that she handled, only four required hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Only four. Because she's providing, because she's providing, she's providing the yeah. services right then and there. And those services are available right then and there. Here's the next one. The average response time, the time that it takes for those resources to get to the officer and the community member in the field. Because remember, KC's here. She's in the building with us. The other services, they're not. So they got to get a phone call. They got to get permission. They got to gear up and then drive to us. Okay? Whereas with those calls for service that we requested, then there was about a 50-minute average response time. But she got better. It was over an hour. Okay, so we got better there. All right, we still have a little bit of room to grow. However, with Ms. Cherry's response time, she had a response time of 18 minutes. So over double the amount of calls for service that the other unit responded to. With more than less than half of the hospitalizations that were required by the other unit. That's powerful, powerful numbers. And it sounds like you need an on-site officer at night. That's what we're hoping <laughs> they say. <laughs> so, good thing about it. Out of all these calls for service, and this is just Ms. Cherry's numbers, out of the 76 calls for service that she responded to, with all the good numbers that I just gave you about those, knowing that only four of those had to be transported to the hospital, oh, and she only had one involuntary commitment. One involuntary commitment. Let me ask you a question. When you say transported to the hospital, you're talking about the local emergency room? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, what is what is the ratio of people once they uh, are transported to the hospital, they're actually uh, um, uh, uh, on three to ten day um, uh, short term care is resident? Because I, I know at, at one point the officers had to stay at the hospital until this person was evaluated by the hospital. Sometimes the officer had to actually take them. That's right. <laughs> um, and so, how, how many have actually been sent to short term services? So, have, have I don't right? have the data or access to the data to be able to answer that because right now, what we're tra tra tracking is the time that the officer is involved I got or the time that this chair is involved. Mm -hmm. I would be kind of remiss if we started tracking the amount of time that certain individuals spend getting medical care. Gotcha. I, I, I don't know that that would be a, a proper law enforcement function. Gotcha. I, I would be, I, I, I would recommend us, law enforcement, stay away from trying to track that data. That's, that's personal <laughs> private. We don't need that. Um, but, yes, to, to answer your question, we, we used to we have to stay that entire time and then transport to wherever that facility was. And now we're, we're not doing All right, so um, was that a follow up question? Uh, I want to let you get there. Okay, good deal. Good. Thank you, thank you. All right, so again, the 76 calls for service over the two month period, 18 minute response time, one ABC, four hospital transports. That gave Ms. Cherry a 50% diversion rate out of all the calls that she responded to. And let me tell you what that means. You heard Chief Hassel say with the diversion rate, that could be her identifying the needs that were there. What we're seeing may not be what's causing the problem. 
The problem might be food insecurities. The problem might be housing. The problem might be mental health, okay? So what she's done, she's been able to break down outpatient diversions based off of outpatient therapy for mental health, outpatient therapy for substance abuse, outpatient therapy for medical conditions. How in the world do you get medical conditions? A person could have a medical condition that causes them to have a crisis yeah. of some sort, okay? <laughs> then there were other community resources, um, of course the hospitals and um, um, other outsourced um, entities that were able to provide different services as well. That's where 50% of uh, her response went to. Uh, and that also included her being on scene for um, a total of approximately two hours per person that she's dealt with. That's two hours that an officer can spend out on the field preventing a crime from happening or responding to a crime that's been in progress. So, as you can see, I've thrown an enormous amount of numbers at you. And, and I'm sorry, I, I, I know when numbers are flying at me, I'm just not trying to keep up with all of them. But I want you to see and hear that it, so far, or it has been a blessing for our community. We are finally putting the resources out to the community members that are in crisis that need. Cool. Okay, I got a few questions. Let me start. Yes. Uh, so, who pays for her position? So, her position is funded by the managed care organizations, which are funded but by each government. individual county. Right. right. That was, that's a very good question, so I'm going to tell you why. That was one of the major roadblocks that we ran into when we was trying to get this program up and running. Right. Because our city is inherently divided into two counties, so that's one of the things that makes it beautiful. Okay? But when it comes to being divided into two counties, we got to make sure that it, being the city of Rocky Mountain, yeah. that we're providing services to everybody right. the same. With yeah, Nash County, was one, that's and right. Access does the other. Trillium was one, and East Point was the other. So that's why we had to bring all the stakeholders to the table. The good thing that worked out for us is that through the negotiations, Integrated Family Services mm -hmm. was able to be a vendor for both managed care organizations. Thus, the funding for the citizenry of the Nash County side of the city of Rocky Mountain came from the Nash County managed care organization. And the funding for the citizens on the Edgecombe County side came from the Edgecombe County managed care organizations. So if none of that money comes out of the city of Rocky Mountain or the Rocky Mountain taxpayers' pockets. The only thing that we provide for her is our office. That's a good thing, but it's also a threat because we don't control when that money expires, right? So from my understanding, they have allotments for, to provide services, some of which being probably community services. And you're saying that Trillium is paying for the contracts for, for that. So Trillium decides to drop your program. You know what? What kind of um, what do y'all have? In, do y'all do y'all have contracts or MOUs with? So we do have an MOU in place with Integrated Family Services. With uh, Integrated Family Services. That's correct. And then they leverage the relationship with Trillium and Access East yes, to sir. try to keep the program alive. Yes, sir. That's have they expressed? Okay. Did Trillium and Access East? I'm getting the equity here. Did Trillium and Access East? Um, Pick Integrated Family Services. Integrated Family Services was one of, one of the only programs that was identified to cover both um, counties. So it's a strategic partner. That's okay, correct. That sir. makes sense. <laughs> and are they committed to this? Yes, sir. Okay. Yep, one hundred percent. I would say committed to the point that um, during the funding conversations that I did not include myself right. in because that right that's not my core. I was. Integrated Family Services told us we're not going to have a problem getting this thing off the ground. Okay, good. We just got to find the right way to do it. Right. And the last question I have is, how is this uh, program connecting into community violence uh, intervention? Well, there's, without a doubt, we all know that there are ties towards low social economic conditions, mm -hmm. people of color, okay, and, and um, crime. Mm -hmm. All those things are connected and intertwined in ways that I don't have to explain to any community member or committed member in this room. What we're hoping that we can do is we can forge a relationship with the mental health providers, the clinicians, the true doctors, 
and they can help us respond to community members in need. The goal is to reduce ambiguous encounters with law enforcement. Yes. Um, we've seen time and time and time again <laughs> where there are encounters with law enforcement that could have been resolved in a different way. Um, good or bad, not saying anybody's right, not saying anybody's wrong. But I would say that the way your, your police department has responded to that has been proactive in identifying that we've got community members that need help. So what are we doing proactively to make sure that they're getting the help? And this is it. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just a last part real quick. Uh, does, does the data you have for right here, because this is great data, does this impact the domestic violence data that you're putting out about what's happening in the community? I can't say, okay. um, only because I don't want to speak on it and not have the data to back it up. I'm just thinking, like, how could we, you know, it's changing the narrative yes, of, of how we deal with each other and, you know, addressing domestic violence. Yes, how can we leverage this program in the community to make people more aware about it as well? Maybe we can spread these cards a little further and then, right. um, you know, how does it tie into our plan for domestic violence? So, so, oh, so yeah. if I could just tie in on that a little bit. I can't remember if you were here. I think you came in. I'm not sure if you were here when I gave my intro. Um, I was here. So the victim's advocate position. I think some of the numbers you hear him talk about here when it comes to people in crisis, mm -hmm. some of those numbers we talk about domestic violence, once we have that victim's advocate position in place, we'll be able to see some of those things. Because I think you will see some of uh, factors that are similar, they run parallel to each other in, in the same crisis, like alcohol, you know, substance abuse, you know, there are some mental illness at times involved in domestic violence, um, but if it's a financial issue, if it's a home condition that maybe um, the crisis counselor has noted, uh, you know, the few food insecurity, stuff like that, some of those same things are probably going to be noted once we start having more follow-up with our victim's advocate. Um, and I think we'll be able to, that's gonna be a longer running tally, but you know, probably in 12 to 18 months of that being in place, we'll probably have a good picture of how those intertwine with each yeah, other. I wonder how many of those victims are like repeat offenders or repeat calls or, you know. Well, I, I would say that based off the mental health data that we're tracking right now, if it's anything related to that, it's going to be a high number. Um, because again, I think one of the main contributing factors to our numbers being so low for this first two months is the fact that we're doing follow-ups. Right. The follow-ups right. are very important because if you can prevent this community member from going into crisis, that prevents a response to a crisis. Uh, I just want to speak to the funding formula um, in terms of future funding. You know, uh, entities like Trillium, I guess these forms still give you some block grant money. They have some problems with it. But your state level uh, mental health agencies are getting funding from the government to provide crisis management services to them. And I would think to coordinate with an entity like law enforcement will actually help them reach their numbers more. And so you could have a relationship here that could be ongoing and benefiting both entities because at the end of the day, I mean, each county. There's a lot of a certain amount of funds to provide mental health services. Yeah. And so uh, with a program like this where you're actually identifying a greater need, you're providing more services to more individuals, those are the kind of numbers your uh, funders at this level want to see so that they can say, yeah, this stuff is working. And so I think that the, the financial end could be on pretty solid ground. Um, to add, just follow up to which you uh, stated earlier, what are we doing to put this message out? Uh, we did a rollout with Integrated Family Services that was aired on WRAL. Um, that is linked to the Police Department's Facebook page. Um, as you all know, this May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. So we are working with uh, Integrated Family Services to be able to put out some sort of PSA and also advertise what we're doing. Um, Ms. Cherry drives a vehicle that's identifiable with Integrated Family Services. Um, and we also, each one of our officers have these referral cards as well for them to be able to disseminate to members of the public who may be interested as well. That's good stuff. Do, do you I also, that, yes, sir. Do you also break the numbers down countywide? 
Well, that is possible. Mm -hmm. I don't. Um, and I, at your request, if she was proof where I will, um, we'll just send it right now. Right. That's. Your total number of calls that initially was 700, yeah. 1,700 and something. Yeah, right. I'm sure you could probably break that down. I'm sure we can, without a doubt. Just the yeah. same as, as your number. It would be interesting to see those numbers. All right. And if there's a need to make to allocate any type of additional service for a particular county based on the numbers you're getting or the crisis situation you're seeing, so I'm just, I'm just doing it out. No, no, you're right, you're right. So what I'll say is the police department doesn't break right. that number down. Right. But as you know, Integrated right. Family Solutions has a contract with both East Point and Trillium. Right. So I'm quite sure that they can provide some type of factual financial or response data or something like that. I think they have to buy law. Yes, sir. Any other questions I can answer or any other information I can provide for you guys? Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Awesome. We certainly appreciate you guys. That was some powerful and impactful information. Thanks, if there are no other questions, um, we'll hold you guys. Thank you, guys. Have a good afternoon. Let me say good evening to everyone. Uh, we want to realize that we jumped down uh, to the police department, which was item number five, uh, I guess in order to help. To this point. So let's go back to uh, the top of the agenda. And um, again, we've been called to order. We, we've been welcomed. Uh, let's have a word. Father God, we thank you right now. God, we thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom. God, most of all, we thank you today for understanding. And God, we pray now your continued blessings upon our city. Oh God, that you would continue to cover us and protect us, that we would be blessed going out and blessed coming in. Now God, we ask that you would join this team as we make ready, oh God, to move forward in the business at hand. Help us to lean not to our own understanding, but to acknowledge you in all of our ways. God, that you shall direct our paths. Order our steps now and guide our tongues. Help us to make righteous decisions and give us great judgment. Truly, God, we love you, we honor you, we magnify you, we give you all of the glory. And God, we give you all of the praise. It is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Um, at this time, we stand in order to, uh, well, to move in the roll call. Do we have one? I know we got one. The roll call. William Sharp, Bill, Nehemiah Smith, Lorenzo Ellis, Linwood Wynn, Cynthia Cobb, Teresa Stokes, here, Muhammad Sahane, Cooper Blackwell, here, Thomas Green, here, Terrence Taylor, here, Harlow Dillon, and Maria Sanchez. I'll be next time. Mm -hmm. Ooh! That's <laughs> good. Yeah. Been a minute. So at this time, uh, we stand in order to receive a motion uh, to approve our agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and probably second that uh, we approve our agenda. We've had time to consider. Are you ready for the question? Yes, All in favor, use the word sign on. Aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. We need to do the approval of the February, March, and April minutes. Do we have to do those separate or can we join them? Your pleasure. Head of body. Y'all need three copies. Yeah. 
motion to probably second that we approve the minutes for February, March, and April. You've had time to consider. Are you ready for the question? All in favor, just to go to sign aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Ayes have it, so moved. Again, we thank uh, Chief uh, Hassel and the uh, City of Rocky Mountain Police Officers for the uh, report. I thought it was some good stuff. And uh, something that you know, we need to be sharing in our communities, uh, letting them know of the resources that are available. With the closing of all of our mental health facilities, uh, everything now is looked at from our standpoint of view as criminal. But it's not. Sometimes they just need medical. All right. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, if I can, I want to um, let people know, um, if y'all need the word out, because everything is formal. There's a crime for me that we'll be running over in West Mountain. We do offer more help um, for our athletes. Um, we just recently started putting a program. We had a battle mental health come out and evaluate some of the kids through a camp. And it's a big need. Um, even young kids, as young as fourth grade, mm -hmm. she came here because we do get income for people in the program. That when they come in and train for basketball, she will pay them for competitive performance. Also, looking at some of the programs. We also offer a behavioral health service. We have a couple. Who is that? Oh, I see. Okay. They've expanded their services tremendously. Oh, yeah. We have primary care, dental, pharmacies, um, community health, urgent care, women, women's health. So, yeah, we have three phar two pharmacies now. No, we have a total of 10 centers around Rocky Mountain. Yeah. Our uh, behavioral health center is two of them. One of them is Camino Plaza right beside Target, that little medical park. And the other center is right across from Candlewood um, in that medical park where the dental office is. Our behavioral health site is right there. That's fully behavioral health. Um, so it's, it's by appointment, you schedule appointment. Um, but you know, we take Medicaid, insurance, yeah, private dental. Too. Oh yeah, we have dental. Yeah, have dental. So what if you don't have insurance? We take uninsured patients as well. And then we, we put them on a slotted fee scale. So you bring in proof of income. And then based on your income, you have a slotted fee from $25 to like $80 or something like that. Um, so it's very affordable. But if you are homeless, you know, you can bring in 25 cents, a dollar, whatever you can pay, and we'll serve you. Now, Cooper, with the Medicaid expansion in this state, yes. that should help. Those services. Absolutely. Right. Yes, Medicaid expansion is going to be able to close the gap. So there's people that make too much money to be on Medicaid, mm -hmm. but not enough money to afford private insurance. So since the government finally, after years of fighting, it has expanded Medicaid, they're, they're trying to close the gap. So they've, they've expanded the threshold for income um, as far as getting affordable for Medicaid. Uh, health services. But there are also community health centers that the community should know about all over the work, all over the country, really. Um, 
that provide services for people that don't have in, like have make a lot of money, um, and also people who are uninsured. That is the whole purpose of federally qualified health centers or community health centers. The whole purpose of them is to serve uninsured people, people who got low income, um, and we serve about sixteen thousand patients a year. Awesome. Thank you so much. Anything else? If not, then next is our date and appointment uh, recommendation. We had received uh, resumes from two individuals. Being Latanya Gunter, she's the human resource manager at the uh, Rocky Mountain Housing Authority. Chair, I want to say that Ms. Irene is more than just a retiree. Um, she's a retired educator, um, as you mentioned, that's why she retired. She's also a resident of Edgecombe County. Edgecombe, she has experience at Edgecombe National Local Health Center, disabilities. Um, so it's more than her just being a retiree. I do want to emphasize that. And um, that's important to know for those of you who have not taken time to look over the um, the resume, but um, you know, she's more than just a retired. And I also like to say that um, on behalf of Latonya Gunter, she's also a resident of Edgecombe County. Uh, she is the Human Resource Manager at the Rocky Mount Housing Authority. Uh, she is a youth advocate at her church. She's a part of Delta Sigma Theta uh, Incorporated sorority. Uh, very, very um, hands-on in her community as far as working with, with people and youth. Um, I think that uh, she would be very instrumental uh, because she has her hand, her, her church is on the corner of Redgate and uh, Clark Street. So um, they are out in that community all the time, doing things in the community, working in the community, cleaning the community, uh, talking with citizens in the community all the time. And I think she would be a tremendous access to this body. Um, may I add additional? Uh, Ms. Irene is also from Berkshire, and Berkshire is doing a tremendous thing, but it's not just about that community but the overall experience that they do throughout the community. So I do want to emphasize that as well. And I just ask that each of you just um, just do you make your best judgment. Yes, sir. So at this point, what's the process? I'm going to come to that over the process. So the process here, I will uh, entertain the motion to cast the vote. Uh, and like I said before, uh, this will be the recommendation from this body to report to the 
questions, um, we will start, and so if you can um, share your preference by sound and I, we will start with Ms. Gunter first, uh, and your information related to her, all those in favor of Ms. Con Ms. Gunter, do so by show of hands. Okay, the next candidate is all those in favor of Ms. Brown, do so by show of hands. One, two, three, four. Okay. Okay. So that was uh, three for Ms. Gonter and four for Ms. Eileen Brown. That will conclude that transaction. Uh, and so as to that recommendation will be forwarded to the clerk's office. Thank you very much. Took a while, but we finally got there. Next is the uh, commission members' concerns and questions. Uh, last meeting, uh, we had some concerns as it relate to conducting the business of the commission uh, due to lack of a quorum. And so we said in that meeting, we would come back this meeting. Uh, to put uh, to the commission that if we do not have a quorum, that we do not hold up the business of the commission, that we be able to proceed uh, with the uh, members that we have here. And we say that because if you look at this agenda, we are approving minutes from February, March, and April because there was no quorum. For the information, mm -hmm. um, actually, I think uh, a more, a little more clear summary would be that you know we talked, we discussed the quorum about addressing the quorum. We didn't really say that we were going to convene despite not having a quorum. I think we said no. That that's what we were saying. That's what we were talking about looking at doing. The body has to approve it. That's what came out of the last meeting. Uh, that the body has to approve to to handle business without a quorum, based on who's here. But, I, go ahead. Point of information. I don't think we came to that agreement. I thought the agreement we came to was we were going to address the members of the commission so that we will have members that attend meetings and we will have quorum. I thought we were going to address the membership. That's what I thought the conversation was. If I'm like an well, it's, it's inclusive. We had uh, conversations as relate to both. Okay. But we did not want to hold up the business and, and keep coming to meetings that we couldn't do any work because we didn't have a quorum. Yeah. If they did not have a quorum, you can't meet the right. And, and, and can skip well, that if you approve to do it, you can't. Okay, so that's, that's going to hold up a second. Clarity. Yeah, let's let's yeah, try to interject yeah. this. Um, I think an overarching situation for us being a city commission, we are subject to the mandates of the city that has said in writing that their boards will follow our rules of order. Okay? Therefore, we are not necessarily a freestanding nonprofit. <laughs> if we were a freestanding nonprofit, we would probably have some powers to mandate some things, but I believe, purely because we are a city commission, that uh, we will be forever bound to our rules of order. Right. That's what I think. Uh, if I can check with the uh, city's attorney on that, but I believe so. I think every city, every commission that's come to the city is going to be bound by rules of order purely because it is a city ordinance. So, and to kind of add to that, you're exactly right. The, this commission has had the ordinance when it was created, right. and the ordinance spells out how the body should function. Yeah. And so, not the authority and power against the body to change that. Uh, and all of the board of commission of the city operate the same thing. Um, so that's kind of an overview. 
reach in a position that you can't uh, on that address. But uh, the other part of that is about the numbers. I think, uh, Linda, you, you, you were going to reach out to us. Yeah, I was going to. I suggested to Archie before the meetings to the members and they need to make a few call each other. So I think uh, that might inspire some other ones to participate. Uh, uh, or just a call from one of the chairs. I think I believe to be at this meeting. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I think we discussed that a little bit last week too, and I'm not opposed to that. I think I'm one of the ones that was actually verbally supportive about calling people for account of like a budget system. Mm -hmm. But I think the consensus of the body yes, last time was we need to address this quorum in a sustainable way. And I think, and I'm, and remember, I said this last time as well, I'm not for taking people off that we didn't put up here. But at the very least, we need an assessment of the attendance for members over the last year so we can follow the rules as for as for attendance if you miss three consecutive meetings you are then eligible for dismissal now it's up to our body i believe if i read correctly to make that decision after missing the meeting but if other people are busy or they can't be here or you know they, they just don't have the capacity to serve on a monthly basis, uh, without missing a few, you know, I understand we all got family stuff, got stuff we gotta take care of, you know. But if you're missing three meetings consecutively, repeatedly, then that might be grounds for a dismissal, and we might need to decide as a body to make a hard, de hard decision that we're going to be a sustainable body that deals with these issues, especially what we have coming down, that we have to have the system in place for meeting attendance accountability. And I think the only way to do that for now is to request from the HR department a, a record of attendance for the last year and that we move off of that data in our next meeting. That's, that would be my recommendation. And to add to that, to that really point, this is at the time of the year when uh, the city clerk's office requires from all boards to reach an attendance. And so we're in the process of compiling that. Before we forward that information to, to the clerk's office, we will share it with everybody. And I'm not being a hypocrite. I haven't, I've missed some meetings. You know what I'm saying? I've missed some meetings too. But I, mean, I think we all have. But, you know, we're in the road. That's the rules, you know. Yes, ma'am. Also, um, especially if they have an exclusive of one meeting, since they've been appointed, some of these people are not really remember. I know I've missed a lot. Well, that, that, that's the whole point being made. And, but more importantly than that, this body was put together to handle the business of community relations. And uh, those that were here a few months ago, um, we had a deadline issue that we didn't have a quorum. And so we sent information based upon the deadline that we didn't even approve. To be technical and honest about it. So we we gotta be able to function. And I understand Robert's rules of order, but I also understand that this body was put together for the business of community relations. And if we're not gonna do that, then you know, I don't want the um, council to come in and say, well, y'all are not coming, y'all are not meeting, y'all are not relevant. Let's just do away with this group. Yeah, I think it's a damn point. Yeah, and it yeah. sounds like, Marjorie, again, uh, that I know when I was uh, on the council, I was becoming a member of this body. It was in writing. If you miss a certain number of meetings, the body uh, uh, has the authority to replace you. Uh, and, and I think if the if we probably get that, I believe we can find it right here. And if we do, then we can come back to a point where we can say this person has missed X number of meetings. Uh, at this junction now, this person is no longer an active member. Your quorum changes. Well, that's well, that's a good assessment. You know, the, the <laughs> quorum changes. But we can't make a decision whether the quorum changes because according to the rules, the city of Rocky Mountain. 
it goes on guidelines of each submission of community I mean, and the city clerk's office could identify that person as a member. I have a question when you talk to the other center in the hands. When we did the one where you know they could vote in, you could call in folks, no. Did they respond? Are you referring the, to the absentee? The one that we said we're gonna do it by phone. By phone. About you know, yes. They did respond. Yes. Do we see higher attendance by phone? Clarification. Like, okay, in the past we've done meetings, we made the phones available. Did people, are people calling in? Were people calling in? Do we have a higher number of attendance so by having the phone? Well, clar clarification with that. During the pandemic, we went to virtual meetings. Right, right. right. So, so we tried that for a while. And then um, at one point, some point last fall, I think it was last fall, the city council, um, because we have a lot of board commission, the, the, the city council moved in all meetings as well. Yeah. Okay, so that took away the virtual part. Uh, but a, a, a tool that we have uh, that a member can call and be a conference call. You know, we really never had a, a request for that until the last meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, that option is on, on the table as well. But as far as uh, everybody saying, well, or if a large number of individuals say, I, I can't make it, make it on, on, a, on a consistent basis. So that could be some of But that option for a person to call in, be a conference call, <laughs> I understand your sentiments completely, and I understand like your purpose. I, I feel that. I get that. Um, I'm just a little concerned because you know we gotta, and I feel like we we got a solid group of people. We got a solid team now. We got a solid team now that the community put up. But you know, in order for it to be natural, in order for the nature to remain the same, the purpose of the body itself. Uh, from its for its original pretenses, which I know that was all a little bit, but still, this is this is fundamental. We have to have representation across the entire city. So even you know, if we if we made a decision to have a quorum or to move on with business without the quorum, you know, I, I fear that it would not represent the city accurately as far as the purpose of why we're committed. I feel like it would it could taint it. It could be too many ways where. You know, we're hearing from Ward 7, Ward 6, Ward, you know, and we're missing out on certain neighborhoods in the in the city. So I, I agree. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with yes. that. However, if we're not going to move <coughs> forward with having a business, then we have to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. We have yeah. to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. So we can't do this. I should, the department, we have to let the city clerk's office know how many um, absentees, you know, they're not attending meetings. Correct. Have you ever had to do that? We do it every year. Every year, okay, so they would automatically know. Correct. Okay, now, you want to be some kind of bad laws? Correct, yeah, we got bad laws. Um, have that been updated recently? Last time the bylaws were updated, well, the ordinance had been updated. We the talked about that last that. year about the fair housing, mm -hmm. but the actual bylaws that created the commission, right. that's pretty much the same. So that, that, okay. that's not the Well, that's what I'm getting at. It's right. still the same. It's still the same. Well, that was back in 19 what? Well, the last update was in, uh, the, the commission was created in 1968, Eight, and right. then in 1978, the ordinance was updated, and we are still working off the current. One now that states the number of appointees and how those appointees are used. I want to say, I remember 1968 and 78 was the, so that's the last time it was. And they still have a lot of reviews on it. But you know, like that, and the, the, the fact that individual city council people appoint people from their ward, you know, that might be another avenue for accountability too. Mm -hmm. You know, the city clerk recognizes that this person is just not here. Contact the representative of the council person of that ward and let them know about it and to see if an adjustment needs to be made there. Uh, this body won't be able to do much apart from the authority of the city council, period. Okay. You know, because
because they appointed us, and so they are uh, they are another governing body where we're concerned. Uh, but that we can also use that leverage too, in terms of making sure this uh, this body is together. And uh, just from a historical perspective, Pastor Marine, this body hasn't had a major problem with attendance. I don't think so. And overall, they have not. I think we're coming back from. This is post COVID. Yeah, this is post COVID. <laughs> I think that's what is happening now because every city in Michigan you can think of has a problem with attendance. Even the schools have a problem with attendance. Everyone has a problem with attendance. And I think we can solve the problem that we need to be And I think it's good that you all have addressed the problem and you voice your concerns. And that information will be um, relayed and shared, like I mentioned earlier, uh, with the time of year when that report will be submitted to. Do they typically automatically remove people, or they, they give the list to the commission and let the commission decide what to do? Well, most commissions, uh, most of them, the terms are two years. And so how the report goes in, mm-hmm. the report goes in for that two-year term. Yeah. Uh, it's just not how many they attended for the last 12 months. Mm-hmm. It's say, like you, Cooper, it's just that June is your end of your t- two-year term. We'll report the number of meetings you you came to when you attended in, in that two year time. Mm, that's the and then that's why if, if Teresa was on on her one year of her new term, you know, we will report the number of meetings that you know, so it's 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 perfect. Yeah. But there is like a monthly breakdown, isn't it? Yes it is. Okay. So we'll still know if it's three protected. And also the, the bylaws state that it has a term that says undisputed that happens. Mm. You could have individuals that miss the meeting. But they were excused. So it excused things like the job, the family emergency, and stuff like that. You know, a lot, a lot of you all are aware that we would have had a court at the last meeting that some emergency came with the last meeting. Yeah, yeah. So, which is going to always happen. Which will always happen. Which will always happen. But as, as, as Chairman Williams said, historically, we have not had a problem with those terms. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Um, any other comments? If not, any other um, concerns or questions? Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, this is Jason to the department. Are we meeting this time? Normally, we do not meet during the month of June, July, and August. But I mentioned last month that the meeting we started, we started talking about uh, bringing information back about fair housing piece. And so as information come up, I, it may be a need, and I, I hope it's okay with the commission, that if something comes up, I need to share with you all information as we move forward with that. Um, there may be a need for a, a, a meeting. So um, tell us, if you will, leave that option on the table. But I, I will try not to. Any other concerns or questions? Um, if not, I have, I have, I have one. Um, so tomorrow, there is, uh, I forgot the name of the agency, but there's an agency that's partnering with um, OIC SOAR and uh, some of my social justice organizations like NOACP um, to release some mothers from prison tomorrow. Tomorrow they're going to be released from Edgecombe County Jail. This company is coming from Durham. That's worked with some of the social uh, justice organizations to vet a list of people that have been, um, you know, seen as their their issues were uh, they were either handled unjustly or they were uh, they have enough support services to you know go ahead and be ready for their release back into society. Uh, this group out of Durham is paying for their bail. And um, that'll be tomorrow at Edgecombe County Jail. Um, so that's that's something that's happening in our community tomorrow. Um, and then, Ms. Mr. Jones, I would like to see something on the agenda soon, and maybe I can send some more details about this community violence initiative, especially considering we have stuff already. We have we're having professional. Clinicians go along, do ride alongs with the police. You know what I'm saying? Um, the next level of accountability there is community leaders outside of parents, you know. Uh, so 
I feel like it's high time for us to go ahead and get involved with the justice system a little bit, or with, at least with our community, our individual wards. I don't know if there's a budget allowed or something for us to um, help bring some of the information to the community. Maybe we can each host like one session where, and I, I, I ask to defund the police, but where we can work alongside of the police or somebody, a, a health, health agency, to where we can at least do a presentation in the community, maybe about the same program that they talked about. Uh, but us to decide as a commission, our initiative for the community in regards to violence and public safety, um, which I know has been a hot topic. Um, and it's also, it's also a, it's also a narrative that needs to be corrected. Started with a part of that conversation with Fran. And I don't know the top five things that came out of this group here, number one. And, and so um, when you talk about crime, there are other contemporary factors to it. If you don't address those other factors, you can't do anything about it. You're on the right page here. May I add something? program is called the Mother's Day Bailout because a lot of yeah. um, women are in jail but they can't afford their, their bails. So this is also um, open to, um, it's getting mothers home in time for Mother's Day, but it's also the fact that a lot of the ladies are in jail because they might have uh, did something that was minimal, but they don't have the bail money to get out. So the fact that they arranged it prior to Mother's Day, and it's called the Mother's Day Bailout. Yeah. And um, it's an exciting program, so if any of you all are available tomorrow morning, this is exciting to be able to um, have that to happen. Is there a time that that's going to take? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. No, it's at the jail. And the jail or the courthouse? The jail. The jail. Mm -hmm. The jail. Yeah. Yeah. As far as bail is concerned, how is that in court? Um, so there, this is a national initiative. Uh, Mama's bailout. I forgot the national mission. Mama's bailout day. It's from May 6th to May 12th. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, you know, you have organizations that serve reentering citizens mm -hmm. that you know have a that might have a list of people that they've been working with pre-release. So our people go into jails twice a week, Mondays and Fridays. Monday we go to Nash County, Friday we go to Ashcombe County, and we work with individuals pre-release. That's 90 awesome. days before they get out. Uh, so we start doing some searches there, and then you know there might be a list of people that are ready to ready to come out. They already know what classes they're going to take when they get out. You know they have some idea about how they want to go. That's right. And then this list through the person who did it for us, which is this lady they call Grandma. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> through a person, a well trusted person, she connected them with the organization in Durham, and then. Durham's like, we're coming right from out and building mama's out. So, nine, nine or ten nine people, ten. mothers, Six, mothers, mothers. that can be screened and work with before release. These aren't just like, oh, we're just going to pick ten people that are mamas, you know. So, um, it's a coordinated effort. Charleston. 
Yes, uh, again, listening to the uh, conversation about the uh, quorum, I know when I was on the board, uh, it's probably been about three years ago now, uh, we had people that didn't attend the meetings. And my thing is, it may not be enough to not have a meeting, but it was a problem. Because if they're not coming to the meeting, that's a problem. And I think what I heard was, that you only do it in two year increments, basically. It sounds like somebody need to go to the city council and say, you need to evaluate it earlier instead of waiting to the end because waiting to the end makes no sense. And I know I will be addressing it. And also um, we just redid the Democratic Party in Edgecom County this past Monday night. And that's why I come I go around a video and stuff and I'm gonna make sure things like this is on the radar. So we can address it because I hate to see um, um, we're talking about politics and, and and people not involved. So that's going to be one of the things I make sure that we get involved in. But y'all need to address this um, corn thing. And like you said, it got excused, unexcused, and don't need to wait no two years. That makes no sense. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? If not, then we uh, stand to entertain a motion for adjournment. So move. Thank you all.